Hey, thank you so much for joining us this weekend. My name is Roby. I'm one of the pastors here at City Rev Church, and so glad that you've joined us uh, for this time of Bible study, and we're going to jump right into a passage in the Bible. We're in the series called The Provider, There is One Who Never Fails, and we're in part two today. And you know, this week I was thinking about this class that I took when I was in college It was Intro to Earth Science. And I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I'm willing to bet that at some point, some class you took in high school or maybe you took in college or something like that, you had this experience where you took a class and you're learning information and you're thinking to yourself, when am I ever, ever going to use this piece of information? Maybe you felt like that before, and uh, in this class, we, we, we went, we're in this class, Intro to Earth Science, and the first thing, I remember the first day, the uh, professor stood up, and he just said, he, he was a, a, an older guy, I, I think, I don't know if he was tenured, but he's very seasoned, and he stood in front of the class, and he said, I have taught this class, this course, 125 times. I remember right off the bat, I mean, he wasn't saying it triumphantly, I mean, he seemed exhausted. And I just wanted to say, man, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry you've had to teach this class 125 times. And he goes into the talking about what we're going to look at. And I remember in that class, there were some interesting things. We talked about the weather and weather patterns and things like that. I remember uh, there were some interesting things, learning about cold fronts and warm fronts and how all that stuff happened. There were some practical things. But then we got to this unit on rocks. And we were studying rocks. And I remember when we started in that first unit, that first class, I'm like, seriously, there is nothing more boring in the galaxy that you can study that is more boring than rocks. They don't do anything. They just lay there. And we talked about igneous rocks. We talked about sedimentary rocks. We talked about metamorphic, metamorphic rocks. We had to look at rocks. We had to analyze rocks. And I'm thinking to myself, this is the most boring thing I have ever had to learn. And I'm sorry, there's probably someone watching right now that has a a passion for rocks. And if I'm offending you, I'm sorry. But I remember in that moment thinking to myself, there was no chance that I will ever use this piece of information ever before in my life. Maybe you've experienced that. And so here's what we're going to talk about today. There is something else in your life that you believe, that you've had exposure to, that you've been taught. And I want to show you, because maybe it's something that you've never known how to use, I want to show you how that piece of information is something you can use in your life that is absolutely vitally important. We're going to look at a part of the, a part of the Bible um, that goes all the way towards the beginning. It's the book of Exodus And we're going to look at chapter 16. We're going to start in verse 1. Last week in the Provider Series, we looked at Exodus chapter 15. And this week, we're in Exodus 16. I want you to go ahead and open that uh, with me. And we're going to start in verse 1. This is the story of God's people. Moses has just led them out of Egypt, and they're in the wilderness. And they learn something, learn several incredible things about God. Here's what it says, Exodus 16, verse 1. They set out from Elim. And all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. Now, when it says wilderness of Sin, that's just a direct translation of the Hebrew word. It's not talking about sin. It's just, that's what the name is. Probably relates to the word Sinai. They came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 14th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. Now, make note of that. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel, the whole congregation, grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Okay. They're in the wilderness of the Sinai Peninsula. They're the whole congregation, we're talking hundreds of thousands, are walking into the wilderness. 
And they start grumbling. They start complaining. They start giving Moses and Aaron nasty looks and talking about them behind their backs. They're complaining. They're grumbling. And the reason they're grumbling is because they're in the wilderness and there is no food. Now, I got to be honest. I feel like grumbling if it's gone too many hours without food. And that's not even out in the wilderness. And just to remind you, this is what the wilderness looks like. Here's a picture of the Sinai Desert. I mean, this is, this is no joke. Check out this picture of, this, of the desert. I mean, that even, that looks hot, okay? Like, I just, I feel hot looking at that picture. And you can imagine if you're wandering around in that wilderness, in that desert, I mean, there's not a lot of food options out there, okay? There, there's not, like, crops and animals. You know, you don't have a lot of food options there. And you can, it's hard to blame them for grumbling against Moses and Aaron, here's what they actually say against them. They say, look, you just bring us out of Egypt. Like, did you bring us out here to die? There's no food. There's no food in sight. And yeah, we were enslaved to the Egyptians, but at least we had meat and bread. And they say this, to the full. And the idea of the ancient Hebrew there is, our stomachs were full. We were content and it's interesting that, the, that, when, that when their contentment gets messed with, they start grumbling against Moses and Aaron. Now, again, it's, on one hand, it's like, man, I, I kind of can't blame them. They're in the wilderness with no signs of having any food. But on the other hand, I want to draw your attention to how long it's been since they've left Egypt they left Egypt two and a half months ago. Now, that's a long time, but let me just remind you what they've seen in the last two and a half months. Two and a half months ago, it was for them the crescendo of God's work in Egypt to get the Egyptians to free God's people out of slavery. They were enslaved, they're being treated cruelly, and God is bringing these plagues upon the Egyptians to convince them, these are my people, you don't want to mess with me. If I say let them go, you let them go. He brings boils on them, he turns the Nile to blood, there's darkness, there's, there's swarms of insects. I mean, it's terrible. And finally, the Egyptians are, are just so terrorized by what God's done. They say, fine, we'll, we'll, we yield. And, and they say, okay, you can leave, please actually, please leave. And then God tells his people, this is incredible. He says, uh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go knock on the door of all of your Egyptian neighbors and I want you to ask them to give you their gold and silver. So literally, go knock on the door and I do not recommend you trying this in your neighborhood. Knock on the door. Um, hey, Egyptian neighbor, can I have your gold and silver? And they did that and what the Egyptians said was, yeah, sure, here you go. It's like they were all did this like Jedi mind trick. You will give me your gold and silver. I will give you my gold and silver. And they all handed all of God's people their gold and silver and they walked out of Egypt. That is how God said, I defeated as your warrior, I defeated Egypt. And that's how you plundered Egypt. You just had to ask. You didn't have to break in and steal anything. You just had to, hey, could I have your gold and silver? And then they walk out of Egypt. Well, if you remember the story... Promptly after that, Pharaoh sent his army, the most fearsome army in the world. They chased down God's people. Now God's people have their backs up against the Red Sea. They're like, what, what's happening here, Moses? Are we going to die out here? They say almost the exact same thing they say in this chapter. Their backs are against the Red Sea, and Moses says, you just watch what God's going to do for you. And God parts the Red Sea. They walk through on dry land, and it's not just an escape route, it's a trap because Pharaoh's army goes in after them, and the sea closes on top of the army, and they're drowned. Now they find themselves, they're celebrating, they write a song about it, they're cheering, and then they walk into the wilderness for three days, and this is the passage we looked at last week. They're three days in, they're without water, and what happens? They start grumbling and complaining again. And God does another miracle. They come across a, a bitter, a pond of bitter water and God miraculously makes it sweet and then prepares the perfect oasis for God's people to find water. Now they keep traveling 
and now they're out of food. So look at all these journeys. God saved them from slavery miraculously. He saved them from their enemies miraculously. He saved them from thirst miraculously. All of this in the span of two and a half months. And at some point you're kind of like, you kind of see the trend here. If you've seen all of those miracles, plagues, parting of the sea, miraculous uh, water turning to sweet water that you can drink, if you've seen all of those miracles, at some point you start seeing a general trend of what God is doing. But they grumble again and say, where are we going to find food? Here's, let's pick it up in verse 4, Exodus 16 verse 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them, whether they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily." So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, now watch this, at evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord, for what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full... Because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him. What are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. He will make them full, is what it says. Now, another teaching for another day, I want you to look. They're uncomfortable. They're stretched. They're anxious. They're worried. They're stressed, and so they need someone to blame. They need to be angry at someone because they're uncomfortable in their circumstances. And so they're venting their anger at Aaron and Moses. And Aaron and Moses saying, God's leading this right now. You're venting, you're you're, you're grumbling at us, but this is God that's taking us into the wilderness so often when we get uncomfortable, we're, we just, we're so upset, we need someone to blame. And we vent our anger in the wrong place because we're, you know, we wouldn't want to be angry at God. We know we're not supposed to do that. That's a terrifying thing. And so we find someone else. We don't have the self-awareness always to realize we're venting our stress and our anger and our grumbling and our complaining on someone else. That's what they do here. But God answers, and I want you to look at one thing. We're going to pick up this theme again, and I'm going to jump back in here, but I want you to notice one thing. Moses says, you will see in the evening that he provides, and then the morning. What you have there is you have the order of the day, evening, then morning. We'll pick up that theme again in a second. Let's pick it up in verse 9. Here is what God actually does to provide food for them. Look at this. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, look at this, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Man, again, that that whole verse, this is such a rich text. I mean, we could spend this entire time just on that verse So often, it's in the wilderness that we see God's glory the most vividly. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay on the ground of the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. And when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. 
This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall each take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in his tent. Once again, God says that he's going to, they're going to fill them, he's going to fill them with bread. Remember, their complaint is we were in Egypt, we could have been, we could have eaten to our full. Now he's taken us out into the wilderness and God is saying, I know how to satisfy your stomachs. I know how to satisfy you. You just have to trust me to do it. Here's what God's plan was. It started in the evening. He brought quail in the evening and it descended on, on the evening they could go out and they could gather the quail and they could cook it and eat it. I, I am not the person that understands what happens with killing a bird like that. I'm sure you have to pluck the feathers or something and cook it somehow. I, I'm on the other end. I just get it at the grocery store, okay? So I don't know the before part. You're going to have to talk to someone who does hunting or something. But they captured the quail, something happened, and then they ate it in the evening and they all had meat to their full. Then the next morning, something else happened. I just want to pause here for a second. This is very significant to this text. The relief started in the evening and then continued into the morning. That is significant because the, the way that the ancient Hebrews viewed the day, and this is how God, God taught them to view the actual day, was evening then morning. That is the opposite of what we, how we view the day. For us... Your alarm goes off in the morning, you wake up, you say, ah, time to start a new day. Or at least half of us do that. The other half of us hit the snooze alarm 17 times trying to avoid the new day. Okay, but one way or another, once you get out of your bed and your feet hit the ground, that is in our minds when the day starts. We think of morning, then evening, all through the Old Testament, it's evening, then morning. Their view of how the day works is that when the sun went down, they're like, ah, a new day begins. That's so foreign to us, but it is embedded throughout the Old Testament, and there's an important principle behind that. Evening, evening the quail came, and then in the, that's the meat, and then in the morning, God provided bread. Now, here's what happened. They wake up in the morning, they walk out, they look across the ground, they're in the wilderness, and there's dew on the ground. As the dew goes away, they look, and there's something left behind. It is this fine, flake-like substance, okay? And they said, what is it? And what's so funny to me is, isn't that like every child, when you put like a new dish in front of them, you know, you, you know they're used to chicken nuggets and you put fish sticks in front of them. What is that? I don't, do I, I don't know if I want that. And you hear Moses almost in his frustration. He's like, I, you just heard what, it's the bread. He told you there's bread. And it's something new. It's something foreign. They don't know that they like it. What is it? And it's along the ground. And actually, I'm so grateful the Bible does this. A couple verses later, it actually describes what this flake-like substance was like. So I'm just going to jump ahead for a second. I'll go back. Verse 31, here's what it says. Now the house of Israel called its name manna. It was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. In other words, this substance on the ground that was there every morning... They called it manna. The Hebrew word for manna it sounds just like the Hebrew words for what is it? So what did they name it? They named it what is it? They're looking around on the ground. Everyone's asking what is it? And for all of time, that substance is now known as what is it? Or in the Hebrew, manna. The manna is along the ground. I have always wondered what it tastes like. Here it says it in the Bible. It tastes like a wafer with honey. So I imagine in my mind a Ritz cracker with honey on it. It says it was white. It was very fine. It was flaky. And it was so fine it was like frost. So I kind of picture it like almost like snow. You could scoop it up, but it's like bread in, in your hand. But you can scoop it off of the ground, it's very fine, and it tastes like wafer and honey, or like coriander seed, 
And in fact, um, you can go on the line, online and um, people have recipes that are based on this for manna. In fact, I mean, what else do you have to do during quarantine? Look up a recipe, make yourself and your family some, some manna, and then if you find a good recipe, post it online so that we can try it too. But it, it tasted like wafers and honey. They said, what is it? They would go out every single morning and collect the what is it. Now, how did it work? This is very important. Every morning, they were supposed to go out and collect an omer. That is, a, that is an ancient um, weight of measure that's equivalent to about two quarts, a half gallon. And they were told, gather a half gallon per every person in your home, and that will last you for the day. And it says they, they did that. They'd go out and they'd gather it, and it says every single one of them was full. We all have different appetites. But the way God did the miracle with manna, I mean, it's not just like, here, there's some bread on the ground, there it is. No, no, it's tailored. The, the manna is miraculous even in the digestion. <laughs> Every single person who ate it was full. It was incredible. That, that's part of the miracle. Every morning they would go out and they would collect it. Now, one last section, and we're going to pause for the day. Let's pick it up in verse 17. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over. And whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, watch this. Let no one leave any of it until the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning. And it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. Here is the rule. Gather it. Here's about how much each person needs. They all gathered it. They ate and they were full. And he said this, don't store up any for the next day. Don't save it for the next day. But that was, that was the rule. And some disobeyed. And those who disobeyed, I love how the Bible puts it, it stank. Now, we are all in very close quarters with whoever we are quarantined with. And some of you are having to suffer with stank. And you can appreciate what this is talking about, okay? And don't turn and look at the person that's sitting next to you on the couch and call them out for their stankiness, okay? Have some grace. But in this case, what happened is it, when they left it over till the morning in the night, here's what happened. It, worms were in it the next day. It rotted and it smelled bad. Okay, so here's what I'm envisioning. This is not like there was some mold on the bread. It's got worms. It's maggoty. It is like rotting meat. Rotting meat smells like death. So here's the, here's the irony of this right here. Or here's the pain of it. If you're disobedient, you're saving some for the next day, and you're going to disobey, then it smells bad. And as you're walking through the camp, you're like, what is that terrible smell? And you're like, oh, it's that tent over there that smells bad. It reeks. That, the, the consequence of that sin is detectable to all that's around you. In fact, they all suffer because you held it over till the next day. Now, here, let's just stop and ask this question. Why is that such a big deal? Who cares if they, if they save it for the next day? What's the big deal? Well, why would you save it for the next day? There's only one reason. You don't totally trust the provider. You don't totally trust that the manna will be waiting for you the next day. So what is the sin of storing it up? It's the sin of disbelief. It's a lack of faith that he provided today and he'll provide tomorrow. See, 
all of this season, these, these people are, are God's people. He's about to covenant with them on Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, and, and they're about to just become even more his people. But in this season, he's teaching them. He's teaching them who he is, and he's teaching them how he is going to provide for them. He's giving them an education about who he is as a provider. And, he, and they fall into this trap that over and over they've seen him move. They saw him bring them out of Egypt. They saw him move them through the Red Sea. They saw him make the water into something they could drink, provide an oasis. And over and over, what the problem is, they're not taking how they've seen God move and they're not applying it to their current situation. If he can save them from slavery, then he should be able to save them miraculously. Then he can save them from an enemy army miraculously, which means he can provide water for them miraculously, which means that he can provide food for them in the wilderness. And the problem is they're not taking these lessons that they've learned and then applying it to their current situation. And it's almost like every single time, whether it's fear or thirst or hunger, it's like they're relearning the same lesson. They're not applying the lesson that they learned before to their present circumstance. And you know, we have that same challenge as well. You know, um, a couple weeks ago, there was this little kit that was uh, to build a, a volcano, and I, I was, you paint it first, and I was sitting down with my four-year-old son, and we were painting the volcano, and then you put this solution in, and it makes the volcano erupt, and it looks like lava's coming out, and so we're, we spent like the morning painting it, and then watching it erupt, and you know, we make a total mess, but watching it erupt and erupt, and it's got this little lesson in it, and it's got these rocks, and it's teaching about the rocks, and my son said, Dad, what kind of rock is this? And that's when it hit me. It's my moment of redemption for the rock unit that I had in college. And I said, well, son, let me explain to you what an igneous rock is. It was like, finally, I have a use for this particular lesson that I learned. This is a sedimentary rock. And you can imagine my four-year-old is just not blinking for a while through this whole rock lecture I give him. But I, it's interesting because I've, I've noticed that in some colleges, they have a degree, not just a science degree, but they'll have an applied science degree. Sometimes they won't just have a technology degree, they'll have an applied technology degree, or not just a business degree, an applied business degree. And I don't understand the difference because all degrees are hopefully something you can apply. So uh, hopefully you can apply all of it. If you can't apply it, why are you getting the degree? And see, that's the issue that we have. In our present circumstances, we're called to have faith. What is faith? Applied theology. That's all faith is. It's applied theology. It's taking these things we know about God and applying it to the circumstances we're in right now. And here's what we have. We don't just have our own life experience. We have all of the things, these stories from the Bible that teach us who God is. You say, I don't know any theology. I'm, I'm new at this. I'm a new Christian. Or I, I don't even know if I'm a Christian. I just have questions. But there's things you know about God. He's infinite, all-powerful, supposedly good, works in this world. That's theology. When circumstances get difficult, it's just applied theology. That's all faith is. Applying what we know about God to our current circumstance. So in this lesson of the manna, the bread from heaven, what do we learn about God? Well, the first thing is what we'll call the, the vulnerability principle. You know, earlier on our, our podcast, we recently started a City Rev Life podcast and I had an opportunity to talk with a, a pastor friend, a dear friend named Pastor Wayne Lomax, an awesome pastor down here in South Florida. And I was asking him about seasons of vulnerability. And what he said was just so powerful. He says, sometimes what happens is vulnerable circumstances uh, come around us. We don't know what's going to happen with the economy. 
We don't know what's going to happen with a pandemic. We don't know what's going to happen with our health. We don't know what's going to happen with a loved one. We don't know when we're going to get back to some kind of normalcy. And we feel suddenly out of control and vulnerable. And he says, the problem is, it's not that we are suddenly vulnerable. It's that we're suddenly aware of how vulnerable we've always been. See, we're just as much in God's hands today as we were yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before. And so what do we do when we're feeling vulnerable? We have to look to the past and recount all the things he's done in our life. All the things he's done in our story. And then even beyond that, all the things he's done in the story of history. Recount, stop and say, okay, this here is part of my story. If he takes his people out of slavery, he walks them through the Red Sea, if he can provide water for them in the wilderness, he provides food miraculously on the ground, bread from heaven. My circumstances are no challenge for him. Recount his ways, look to the past. And here's what has, what so often happens, the way, here's what we learn about him as a provider, the way he provides is so often we have to go into the wilderness to learn about who he is. We have to feel vulnerable to learn about who he is as a provider. So often he takes us into the wilderness and that's where we truly see his glory. Know that he's going to provide, but he's going to provide his way. He's not a genie. Provision means not that he's a genie and he gives us what we think we want. He knows how to give us what we need and what will truly satisfy us. We just have to trust him on the journey. How do we trust him? We look back and we recount all of his ways. It's the vulnerability principle, but there's another principle. It's the daily bread principle. So often the way that God provides is he's going to provide every day. He's teaching us to rely on him day after day after day after day. Here's how Jesus put it. He said this in Matthew chapter 6, 34, Jesus' own words, Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. He is going to give you your daily bread today. He says, look, you've got to so trust that I will provide tomorrow that you're not worried about tomorrow, but you're just focusing on today. What would happen is if they were worried about tomorrow, they would store up the manna and it would stink. You know what we do? We worry about tomorrow. And you know what that worry does? It stinks up the whole household. Because when I'm worried and I'm stressed and I'm anxious, I'm snapping at, at the, my kids or I'm snapping at my friends or I'm snapping at my spouse or I'm, I'm, I'm anxious and I'm hard to be around and I'm bitter and I'm complaining and I'm grumbling and it's this person's fault and this person, I can't believe they did this, why didn't they do this? And that worry stinks up the whole house. So just rest. He's going to provide tomorrow. So just focus on today. And so what do we do when we're dealing with the daily bread principle? Don't miss the beautiful possibilities and things he's given you today. Parents, it's hard right now dealing and juggling with all the things. But the reality is having our kids at home, for many of us, this is the most time we will get to spend with our children maybe through their entire childhood. Don't miss that. What do you do dealing with the daily bread principle? Well, when we're dealing with vulnerability, we recount the past. But the daily bread principle, we're thankful for the present. Be thankful for all the things he's provided in the present. But there's one more principle we get out of this. How does he operate as a provider? It's the sunrise principle. See, the way that God ordered the day is it's evening and then morning. It's darkness, then light. With Jesus, it was death, then resurrection. 
See, there is an order that he is wired into the very fabric of the days of the week. It is night and then day. There will be a sunrise. There will not be darkness forever. It will not always be a trial. He will bring about the good. There will be redemption. There will be a day that will be a sunrise. The sunrise principle tells us that it might be difficult now in the trial, but there will be a day where he makes it all right. We will see that day. And even if he, we'll see that day one day in heaven, but we'll see, I believe for us, we will see how he's working this together for good. And so what does that help us do? That gives us hope for the future and we begin to hope knowing the Lord you are going to work this together for the future what do we learn here's how we apply our theology we know he's the provider he will never fail so what do we do you we recount all the things of of the past and it helps us rest in the vulnerability because we've always been in his hands we know that he's going to provide for the for the day tomorrow is in his hands so we give thanks for the day and we know that there will be a day where the sun rises on this trial and we have hope and expectancy for the future. You know, I want to just end with this story. I was recently reflecting this week. There's a story in the Bible where Jesus is calling his disciples and his disciples, Peter and Andrew and James and John, they're fishermen. They have spent their lives fishing on the Sea of Galilee. Their dads were fishermen, probably their grandfathers and great-grandfathers. I mean, generations, they're fishermen. If there's one thing they're experts at, it's fishing, and it's fishing the Sea of Galilee. That is their career. And one night, Peter and Andrew and James and John, they're on their boats, and they're out on the Sea of Galilee. They're fishing, and they catch nothing. An entire entire night of work and they have nothing to show for it. You can imagine how frustrating that is. And they come up to the shore, they've caught nothing, and there is this teacher that they've heard about, Jesus. And Jesus says, um, hey, I, I got an idea for you. Can you just, I know you've fished, you know you're a fisherman, but just cast the net over the side of the boat right there. And what Peter says is he says, We've been fishing all night. And you know that there's probably more in his mind. He's thinking, well, rabbi or carpenter or whoever you are, I think we know about fishing. Uh, we're the experts here. But if you want, we'll fish. And they throw the nets over. I think it was probably half-hearted. They throw the nets over. And such an overwhelming catch of fish happens. So many fish are in that net they have to call over frantically the other boat. The other boat comes in. They're both struggling to pull it in. They, it, the, the amount of fish fills both boats and they're about to sink. I mean, think about that. That means it's the catch of their lives. If they caught fish like this all the time, they'd have a bigger boat. This is probably the catch of their lives. This is the pinnacle of their career. They have never caught a catch like this. I mean, this is like someone who's worked their whole life to make to the NFL. Draft night comes, and, and their name is called. I mean, it is their moment. They have dreamed of a catch of fish like this. And you know what Peter does? He falls down at the feet of Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, follow me. And Peter says, I'm, I'm an unworthy man. I'm sinful. And Jesus says, follow me anyway. And he left his nets and the fish and followed Jesus. He walked away from that moment to follow Jesus. How could he possibly do that? I mean, at least take the fish to the market and then follow Jesus. I mean, why are you leaving it right there? Because what Jesus just did, he called every one of those fish into that net. If he can do that, he doesn't even need to fish. He just needs to stay close to the one who provides the fish. There's a moment when Jesus does this miracle where he divides the bread and these, these fish. He feeds 5,000 people. And the next day they follow him and they said, Jesus, if you can do that, could you call the bread from heaven that, that God's people had in the wilderness all those generations ago with Moses? And you know what Jesus says? He says, I am the bread from heaven. All you need is me. Just stay close to the provider. 
He'll never fail. Some of you are watching this, and here's the step you need to take today. Surrender to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. I think there's some that are watching right now, and that's been a question on your mind. You've, you've journeyed. You know that there's people praying for you. Maybe you're watching with the person that you know has prayed for you and knows you know that they have faith in Jesus and you've been waiting to take that step. I think today is the day. And maybe, just maybe, he's taken you into the wilderness to learn that ultimately you need a provider. Trust in Jesus today. Gave his life on the cross to pay for your sins and my sins and rose again from the dead and just wants you to trust him on this journey. You don't have to have all the answers. Just believe that he saved you on the cross and believe that he's going to provide for you on this journey. You ready to take that step? Let me lead you in this prayer. Wherever you're at, if you want to take this, this step, pray this prayer right now. Say this. Say, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for wanting me. Thank you for loving me. You know I don't have it all perfect. You know that there's things that I struggle with, Jesus. But I give you my life. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay for my sins. Thank you that I find forgiveness in you permanently. I believe you rose again from the dead. And that I too will spend forever in eternity. I follow after you. You are the provider. In Jesus' name, amen. If that was your prayer just then, let me tell you, you just began the greatest adventure of your life. And you're not on this adventure alone. I, we want to hear from you. So let me just ask you to do, if that was your prayer, one thing. I just want to ask you to do one thing. Right there on the screen, there's a place that you can click on the screen that says, yes, that was me. In the comments, there's a, a, a website. It says cityrev.org slash faith. Would you just click on that or go to that website? There's a, a short form that just asks for your information. Here's why we want that. We just want to send you a Bible. We just want to encourage you, pray for you. We don't, we, we don't want this to be something you do all alone. This is a journey, and we're in it together. So would you just click that? Click that link. Let us know so we can, we can journey with you.